Okay. Welcome to LaRouge Rugby Podcast. My name is Dan Murphy, and this is where we put Canadian rugby under the microscope. With me today is Derek Brissett of Layman Sports. Derek, how's it going today, buddy? Oh, pretty good, you man. Yourself? Not bad, not bad. You know, the end, it's the end of the season now, and it's funny, I was on Twitter this morning, and I saw already that some of the Premiership teams already have started training camp, which I just think is insane. <laughs> Like six weeks off, that's insane. They need to figure that out. Yeah, it's uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a little bit of a different culture than what we're used to uh, over here. Eh? Well, I it's just like it's it's funny. Uh, we had a discussion on Twitter uh, with some some of our fans about how World Rugby is looking to shorten their bench, and it's just this mentality in rugby that like you know everyone's a warrior, and you know there's no such thing as burnout. And I just think it's strange that. That this is this is a stance some pro rugby has t- taken, and you know you gotta protect your players. But what do I know? I'm just some kid from Canada. <laughs> yeah, there's, I, there's probably there's probably some scientific reason for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, so, I know we are though. But they got like the, I don't. If they don't start, uh, I don't. I don't think the arrows are gonna start training camp until like late November, December. Yeah, I think it's December yeah. actually. They just try to swing it where they, they just do their whole training camp out west so they don't have to work, deal with snow. <laughs> yeah, so well, gotta, I mean, they should just try to swing the Vancouver team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've got a bunch of things to talk about today. Um, if you guys are interested on Layman Sports, Derek does a lot of really great re- recaps about uh, the Toronto Arrows games that, that kind of happened, uh, especially the, uh, the, the last game that they played against the Seawolves. And also, he did a great recap about the MLR final, which was a fantastic game. Uh, actually, it actually had 500,000 fans watching on CBS, which is great for the first MLR final on CBS. Um, Derek, do you think that uh, that maybe next year we can get more games on CBS, the proper channel? Or I think that the, this game kind of showed that that is something that they should be interested in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, hopefully, uh, like. Yeah, like five hundred thousand is uh, like that's a lot of people. So uh, ho- hopefully, like that's that's always good. It's it's always better to have like the games on like TV that uh, people have like general people have access to, uh, just because it does open the door. It's like you know some of those could have just been like some of those five hundred thousand people could have just been people that were watching whatever was on CBS before. Saw that there was a rugby game on after, and then decided to mm-hmm. leave it on that channel and check it out. Um, you know, there, there could be people that stumbled across. It could be like people that, you know, a bar that left on, uh, like that left the TV on, and things like that. So yeah. it's like it can expose. It can, it can it, it helps if it's like, games are on TV channels like those that are like, uh, you know, that come with the majority of people's cable packages and things like that. It just it just increases the the chance that somebody will stumble across it. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep. It's ultimately a lot better for the game. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned that the stumbling upon I think that was my biggest worry about uh, about the arrows being played on game TV is that it wasn't a very popular channel mm-hmm. to begin with. But uh, on Twitter and on on Reddit, I actually saw a lot of people say that their first arrow game that they watch is just by accident they saw rugby on their on their on their uh, TV guide and they said well we might as well give it a shot so you're right yeah. but with CBS yeah, exactly. it'd be even better because again like that's got quality TV that people have already used to watching um, and I believe that the only other kind of sport was going on was the WNBA and I think the US Open was on on the same day so it was uh it was a little bit lighter in terms of TV so if the uh, MLR can kind of continue taking advantage of TV blocks like that, it'd be great. Yeah, exactly. I, I think the, the one advantage of game TV is definitely that it's basically free um, mm-hmm. with the majority of uh, ca- any cable package that you can get with uh, Bell or Rogers in the country. Um, so, like, just being on a free channel, it's at least if you're interested in it, it doesn't cost you anything to go seek it out and uh, give it a shot. 
Um, as well as like, yeah, if you're already a diehard fan of it, it doesn't cost you anything to watch rugby, which is also great. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, to be honest, I'm a big fan of game TV. Obviously, uh, you know, hope, like the dream is that hopefully one day, you know, we start seeing things on like Sportsnet and TSN. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think like, you know, as far as game TV is concerned, the fact that it's free is a massive advantage. Yeah. And I mean, the fact that, too, I still like well, I'm with Major League Rugby's like broadcasting. So I like all the games being on Facebook, especially at least in Canada um, yeah. or internationally. I like just giving everybody the ability to watch every game for free as well for sure and you know i like putting all the games on youtube and stuff after i think, I think um, that's just boom. because it gives everyone just the chance like you don't have to make a financial commitment to watch any mlr games mm -hmm. um which is just all which ultimately is just better for the game of rugby yeah. as a whole um because you know people you know, if if you had to, if you if you had to like drop like twenty bucks for like a subscription service to watch Major League Rugby, it would probably limit Major. They would probably limit you a little bit to, yeah. you know, people that are already rugby fans, um, and you know, people that are new fans would be more reluctant to, uh, you know, to uh, drop that twenty bucks to watch a sport that they've are just kind of trying out. Yeah. Um. So I think like the the fact that you can basically watch most of the games for free. Um, is a great thing, really. Yeah. Um, definitely next steps in the future for, for the league and especially for the Arrows. I would like to see, you know, a company like DAZN, who does a fantastic job with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Six Nations and, and the uh, the fall international games. I would like to see them kind of step in while still keeping the Facebook. I mean, that that's just one example. I know someone have, some people have suggested that online, uh, but I agree with you. If you're going to start a league, give it to make it accessible for people. You know, that's, that's the bare bones of it. Yeah. I, I don't know if a streaming service like the zone though, would want you to be streaming their event somewhere else for free. That's true. Right? Yeah. That's, a good uh, point. that's like, that is the other, like, I mean, the, the zone is awesome. I do like the zone for their, you know, they have a really good, like their, uh, uh the, like the pro 14 and, um, the like, six nations and all uh, their other like rugby tournaments and stuff. Right? But, um, I'm not, to certain how uh um how like how much um you would they would be interested in still leaving games on facebook and things like that yeah which, that's a good point you know hopefully, like in the future like it's like hopefully in the future you get to the point where you know you can do something like that but i don't know yeah like year one or year two is the like I mean, even year three i guess going into next year i don't know if it's the time to start trying to get people to buy into like a subscription service and stuff. Obviously, like for me personally, I already have the zone. So I mean if MLR ends up on the zone, it'll be it's awesome because I already pay mm -hmm. for it. But um to you know there's there's people that still don't have it. Um so I mean it it'd be tough. It might be a tough sell to get people to uh buy a subscription service to a sport that they haven't watched before. Yeah. Um but like you said, hopefully, if like the zone gets as the zone gets bigger and stuff, then hopefully, you know, people, most most sports fans might end up having it anyway. So, uh, I guess yeah. we'll just kind of see what happens with that. But I like yeah. games for free. You know, I think that's the way to go. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit more uh, MLR news. Uh, six Canadians were named to uh, the first and second MLR teams. Um, Rob Browner and Mike Shepard were named to the first team, and Nakai Petty from the Seattle Seawolves, and then Dan Moore, uh, Brock Stoller, and um, who else am I missing? Brower, Shepard, Kai Penny, Moore, and Stoller. Okay, so five people. So uh, was there anybody that you think else was missing from Team, from team Canada, or not from, from Canada? I think that uh, it's pretty hard considering that I look at this uh, these two lineups and I say, really, I don't see anyone that really could lose their their position there. So it was nice to see um, Morgan Mitchell and um, Sam Malcolm also were named to the second MLR uh, MLR team mm -hmm. from the Arrows. So a good little representation from Canada and from the Arrows, especially, um, which which is nice that you know all the guys have worked hard this year. So it's a nice little reward to see uh, being named to those teams. Yeah, no, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 great. It's good to uh, Mike Shepard definitely earned that. 
Yeah. Uh, he, he was phenomenal all season since coming back from the ARC. Uh, Rob Brower, great to see. Um, you know, that, that guy's that guy's easily been the best loose head prop uh, in the mm-hmm. league all year. Um, and, yeah, and and I'll, I'll stand by it. He should be in the number one jersey at the World Cup. Um, so, hopefully, and, uh, and then the number one jersey at the Pacific Nations Cup. I know we're gonna, kind of going to get into that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's great to see. Uh, Morgan Mitchell, Sam Malcolm. I mean, I think uh, it's too bad Joe Peterson also wears number 10 or else Sam Malcolm would be there on the first team. But, uh, you know, he, Peterson had an amazing year too. Oh, yeah. And his team got to the final. So it's yeah. it's, it's diff- difficult one to argue with. But uh, glad, glad to see Sam Malcolm get that recognition that he deserves as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Morgan Mitchell, same thing. Uh, he, had, he had a phenomenal year. Um, he was, Yeah, he had a phenomenal year. We talked about throughout the, the course of the year how, like the how much like the arrows attack looks can look different at times when you have you know the option of having a guy that can just steamroll over people. Yeah, um, that's yeah. great. Um, yeah, yeah, Dan Moore too. Uh, you know, uh, Dan Moore. I thought I, I think it's great for for Dan Moore uh, getting on to the uh, uh, one of these uh, the all star teams here, considering how much he's bounced around um, as far as the uh, positions that he's played yeah. this year. He's been in the eleven jersey a lot. He's been in the third. Jersey, he's been 14 jersey, and you know, he's been amazing all year, so it is nice to see him just uh, get that recognition too, yeah. even though you know, the even though like a bunch of the you know, the other guys on the all star teams are typically guys that have been locked into that one position all year. Um, for you know, Dan Moore to be moving around as much as he has, playing different sides of the wing, playing in the centers as well. Uh, it's great to see that his his uh, his terrific season gets recognized too. And I think that w- that went to a lot towards him being selected for uh, the the Pacific Nations roster. I think that he has that versatility yeah, of being versatility, either a wing yeah. or an outside center, and I think that that will be beneficial for him coming off the bench, uh, which will be interesting to see. Which we'll get we'll get into soon. Um, yeah, the yeah, last yeah. thing that I want to talk about, about the MLR is uh, one question that was asked by uh, Rugby United Canada is. Who's going to be staying from the arrows? You know, we've got a couple guys that uh, this season was specifically a warm up for the World Cup, and we have other guys that are international. So, who are some people that that you think will be staying, or you've talked to that have been staying, uh, or are trying to make the attempt to come back to Toronto next year? Yeah, I think uh, obviously uh, it'll be interesting to what ultimately happens. I think it's still kind of. Uh, it's still like a little early in some cases, and some guys are focusing on uh, Pacific Nations Cup and things like that. Uh, Leandro Leibis and Gaston Mirez are negotiating their contract to come back. Um, they absolutely loved it here. Um, if the, they that they absolutely loved it here, every time you like you talk to them, just, like this is they just found it amazing to being in Toronto playing for the Arrows. Um, so they absolutely love it and really do want to come back. Um, so they're negotiating that right now. Uh, as far as I know, that's not done yet. Um, but you know, it's, you know, it's just, it's sports, there's contract negotiations. So yeah. They take time. So I mean, we're Toronto um, but fans. as far as I know, they want to come back. Yeah. We're Toronto Sorry. fans. So we've been dealing with the Mitch Marner contract negotiations. So we know all about how we have to be yeah. patient about that. I think, yeah. I don't, I don't think, uh, live is in. Mirrors are asking for six million more dollars than what they're worth. But, um, so I, I don't think the the gap is that much. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it's um, yeah. So I mean, I would fully expect them to be coming back. Uh, Mitchell and Malcolm are kind of uh, up in the air. I'm not uh, too sure either way on that one. They are going to go back. Both of them are going to go back and play in the Mitre Ten Cup. Uh, Mitchell's going back to uh, the Stags. Uh, Malcolm will be playing for the Turbos, uh, which doesn't necessarily, they haven't like um, confirmed anything really either way. Um, but um, like it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, Malcolm and Mitchell did both play for the Minor 10 Cup last year and then come and play for the Toronto Arrows. Um, so they're seemingly on like year round rugby right now, um, which, you know, which isn't necessarily a bad thing for them. Um, Morgan Mitchell does now. If you follow him on Instagram or if you see him in person or if you have seen him in person, he does have Canadian tattoos now. Um, so probably safe to say that he's enjoyed his experience. 
um, especially or at least enough to permanently ink it on his body. Um, so uh, that could be, uh, I don't know, that could be a positive sign that he might be, at the very least he enjoyed his time here and could be considering coming back too. But that's also just me reading way too much into a tattoo. Um, but uh, yeah, and then hopefully uh, I expect the, I would expect the uh, the big guns to still be coming back too right now. So um, I don't know, hopefully, uh, you know, as the off season wears on here, we'll be able to slowly uh, get more and more information as the, uh, the off season wears on here. Yeah, and the big the big one that I find interesting that you talked about was uh, uh, Merez and uh, Levas because you know they're they're the rumors in of the the pro rugby league in South America having a couple teams in Uruguay mm-hmm. um, would yeah. have been an interesting pull to see if they could have gotten them, but maybe maybe they they felt that Toronto is a better home for for them and in their career. You know they're starting to get near the end of their career and they want to try something new and so it's, it's a very interesting. Um, situation that 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 they're in yeah well like, i i did i wrote an article about that on uh layman sports where i basically interviewed uh both mirez and livis and uh you know they uh they, they they really uh really enjoyed the like the quality of play and like the level of training and everything that they got in major league rugby um and i mean obviously you know uh they're, they're really happy with you know major league rugby and uh um, the South American League coming in because it can give it gives a lot of Uruguayan players um, the option to play professionally. Um, Uruguay, when uh, at the 2015 World Cup, Uruguay only had four professional players, um, like on their squad. Um, so, uh, you know, going into this year, their whole starting 15 looks like it's going to be professional, plus some guys on the bench as well. Yeah. Um. So they they're like it's definitely. Both the the South American League and Major League Rugby is certainly opening up some doors for uh, Uruguayans as well as other South American nations, um, and, and, you know, to get those for players to get those opportunities to commit themselves to rugby full time. Um, so it, it could be good. Um, it could. We'll uh, we'll see how the that first season there goes, um, and everything. Hopefully, it goes well. And stuff. Um, but. You know, but um, you know, I, I still don't. I don't necessarily think that that uh, right away is completely deterring guys from coming back to Major League Rugby, especially the guys that have really did enjoy it. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, I said, well, like, we'll see what happens. Like I said, nothing that I know of being official yet. So, I mean, it's uh, you know, up until up until contracts are actually signed, it's always possible that right. guys come back. But I know. I know from from speaking to them, it sounds like they definitely want to come back. Um, so, uh, hope, like I said, was hopefully the you know all the negotiations and things go well, and uh, you know nobody nobody's pulling a Mitch Marner on anything here, and uh, you know we could uh, we, hopefully we can uh, you know get a good chunk of the team back because uh, you know that this team this team was phenomenal all the or all year, especially after the ARC once they got. You know, once they really had like the true full strength of their team back, uh, you know, they went you know seven and one, seven and one at the end of the year. Um, the, so it's uh, you know, it's uh, they had a seven game winning streak to pull it out at the end too, um, just to make the playoffs. Um, so I mean, this uh, having the full roster for the entire season, um, that record might might look significantly different as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, hope, that's hopefully. For sure. a, I'm hopeful that a good chunk of the team is going to come back. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to start talking about uh, Canada's roster announcement for the Pacific Nations Championship. Uh, mm-hmm. Last week, Rugby Canada announced their, their, their starting training camp roster, which uh, had not too many surprises. A few of them were quite surprising. Um, Derek, who do you think is missing from this roster that you think should have been given another shot? Well, I think I think the the big omission here is Brock Stoller. Um, I know uh, I've seen I've seen the arguments on on Twitter about why Stoller shouldn't have been included. Um, you know, a lot of people bring up his his defense is uh, his defense, the fact that Canada's pretty deep on wingers. Uh, I think to that I say that this this is this is training camp and um you know I think uh you sometimes like I think it's training camp it's like you you didn't even really 
have to cut anybody to bring him. You could have just brought him as the 45th guy if you wanted to. Um, and uh, but yeah, like it's training camp. I think you should. I think you should be giving guys the opportunity to, you know, play their way onto this team, even if you don't think. You know, even if as it stands right now, you don't think they're going to be, uh, they'll be on that team. But I think, uh, I think you should definitely be giving guys the opportunity to earn their spots. Um, and, you know, to ha- have the Major League Rugby's leading scorer left off the team, I think is a bit of a surprise. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's my biggest, uh, that's, that would be my biggest omission would be Brock Stoller. And I think one of the things too that 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 kind of confuses me about Stoller is he does have fullback experience, both yeah, uh, both with the Sea Wolves last year he covered a few games and also, um, you know he's played fullback in other other uh, fields. So to have that versatility, which is something that Kingsley mm-hmm. Jones really likes, is uh, is strange not to have him included in the roster. Uh, yeah, another, another guy that I saw that that's not included in the roster, and this one is was very confusing for a lot of people is uh, Brett Bukeboom, uh, the lock from the Cornish Pirates. Yeah, uh, This one was very interesting um, because he was on the World Cup roster. You know, he was he was on the repechage uh, lineup. You know, he started started the first game against Kenya. You know, uh, M- Mike Shepard kind of stole that spot from him, but it's interesting to not see him. Uh, but they have guys like Connor Keyes in the lineup. So... That one was really interesting to me to see him not be included in the lineup. Yeah, I think uh, I mean ultimately, yeah, Bukaboom and uh, and Staller are like this the two glaring ones. I don't think like beyond that, I don't think yeah, I don't think beyond that there's there's too many uh, there's too many other guys that I feel like got really hard done by here. Yeah, um, just but but yeah, again, like it's uh, I don't like. Yeah, with Bukaboom, like I don't know, maybe the the worst thing that happened to him was Mike Shepard and Paul Cialini and Kyle Bailey killing it in Major League Rugby this year. Yeah, um, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm um, the other thing too with Lock with Lock too sometimes is like depending on what they what um, what Kingsley Jones really decides to go with. I mean, like Tyler Ardron has been playing Lock for most of the season down with the Chiefs. Um, so I mean, like, it, like I know most people have him slotted at eight on their, you know, if he did like a, you know, a projected like starting fifteen and stuff for Team Canada. Um, mm-hmm. But I think the fact that like Ardron really is is an option that could even slide into slide into lock if you decide to do it, because um, that that's where he, he's had an amazing season for the Chiefs and that's where he's been playing for the bulk of it. So. Um, you do. You, you even have like Arjon to contend with there for a spot at lock, in my opinion, too. Yeah, especially in some of those games where Arjon might not be starting because he's um, because you know it might be one of the, one of the other games against uh, Italy or, or the Spring Box. He might come off the bench and play lock. So you're right. That is also an interesting kind of side to it as well. So um, the next thing I want to talk about about this roster is where do you think the big position battles will be because there are a few of them that uh, will be interesting to see who gets to the final world cup spot. Honestly, um, I know you, uh, you told me that you were going to ask this question. So uh, I, I did kind of prepare for it and I was trying to come up with what I think would be the biggest position battle um, until I ultimately just sat on every single one of them. Um, you know, we, we are, unless your name is DTH Vandermerver. Tyler Ardron or Phil Mack or Lucas Rumble, just because they, you know, they're the two best players in the country, and then they're the two captains. Um, if though, if you if you're not one of those four guys, um, you sh- really should not feel safe about your spot on this team. Um, and so I think you know every single one of the the, the positions is completely up for grabs. Um, where they you know we're talking about a team that. Uh, barely, barely squeaked their way into the the World Cup. They needed the Repechage tournament to do it. Um, they handedly won the Repechage tournament. They were so great in that, but they still needed the Repechage tournament to do it. Um, you know, they had the America's Rugby Championship earlier this year. Uh, they lost to Brazil during that, so um, you know that's not necessarily the best sign going forward either. Yeah. Um. So 
like uh you know um it's like n- nothing should be nothing should be solidified on this roster uh which goes back to why i'm surprised you know staller and bukaboom aren't included because you know you like you re- we really should just be taking the guys that are playing the best now um you know so it, like that's why like it, it is nice to see you know some guy like it is nice to see that, like, I think 26, yeah, we have the 26 Major League Rugby guys on the team. 13 of them are arrows, by the way. Um, but it's nice to see, like, some of these guys that are, uh, you know, get seem to be getting, like, second chances here. Because, like, you know, uh, I think Rob Brower definitely earned his way onto this roster with his play. Same with Mike Shepard. Uh, Dan Moore probably did that as well. And the Kai Penny uh, had an unreal year. Um after Billy got taken out with his injury for the season. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there's a lot of guys on here that uh, even, you know, at scrum half, Phil Mack, um, Andrew Ferguson, and uh, Jamie McKenzie all had great years in Major League Rugby. Um, so it's like, it's, it is great to see that, you know, like the fact that allowing these guys to play, you know, full time seems to be paying dividends for, you know, all, like, you know, allowing them to play their way back onto the team and earn spots into the camp roster. Right. Um, but I also think that it makes the position battles way more interesting. Um, just because, you know, you have a lot of guys that are going to be coming into this this camp in uh, in some pretty great form. Um, I don't know, like, this is probably the best Mike Shepard has ever played in his life. So, I mean, even if you are, uh, you know, Connor Keys or Evan Olmstead, guys that have traditionally started that lot, it's like you have Mike Shepard breathing down your neck now. Oh, yeah. So he, um, he, you, he, you he better bring it. If, uh, yeah, if you want to play at the World Cup, you better bring it during the Pacific Nations Cup here. So, uh, um, yeah, because there's there's a guy behind you that, you know, if you don't play well, there's a guy behind you that will. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you don't give it, if you don't give it your all, there's a guy behind you that definitely will. If he doesn't, there's a guy behind him that definitely will too. So, yeah. Um, if, uh, so I think every single position is definitely up for grabs here. Um, yeah, like I said, unless you're, unless you're are drawn DTH rumble or Mac, but, uh, just because I, you're not cutting captains and you're not cutting our drawn in DTH. So, no. um, so, uh, yeah. So unless you're those four guys, um, you know, and even if you are one of those four guys, you still better work your butt off to make yeah. this team too. I think I think uh, uh, Jeff Hassler coming to this team as well really has changed the dynamic of of the back line. I mean, uh, if you mm-hmm. asked me before he came he came out of retirement, uh, what would be the interest most interesting uh, position battle? I think I would have said you know the left wing. Uh, yeah. But now it's you know it's it, he's basically got a spot locked down, so it's all basically up to Taylor Paris to kind of. Put Nobody's in a good a match. Spot locked down. Did you not just hear what I said? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think he, I think he, he's <laughs> he's got a good chance of keeping his spot. Yeah. Um, now, one oh. question that we had that from uh, some guy named Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. Uh, he did have Solid a question. News, that, news. Yeah, <laughs> he did have a question that I thought was very interesting, and I wanted to address it. And it also had kind of has a little little other question from Rugby United Canada. Um, who is the most likely call up from the sevens and the U twenties? And then the second piece of that was from rugby United Canada is some fans have been saying, don't do it. Don't call up anyone from the sevens because of the inexperience that they had from Harry Ama playing at 10 at the last world cup. So first part of the question is who do you think is likely to get called up from the sevens and the U twenties? And the second part is, do you even want anyone from those teams? Okay, I think I think I'm gonna combine the two questions because I think it's easier to answer and it's more fluid to say in this way. Um, yeah, from the sevens, I I, I agree. Uh, I agree with Karen. Um, it's yeah, don't don't take anybody from the sevens. Uh, like if you do, like what what are you doing? Um, they had yeah. Um, and it's not even going back for the whole the whole thing about uh. You know, it's like, yeah, we have they have some inexperience. Playing sevens is different than playing fifteens. Um, some of the strategies are different. Some of like your training and stuff is different. Um, but but like it not even going back to, you know, some of the sevens players that were, you know, maybe unsuccessful at the previous World Cup. It's just we like rugby Canada literally like the players just literally went on strike to not be considered part of the same players pool as the fifteen uh side team. Um 
like that the, there was a literally like they had a whole strike and like like a labor dispute um they tried to get unionized all because you know rugby canada was trying to you know get them to be part of the same player pool and just have one player pool for sevens and fifteens where you know you're not going to know if you're going to be playing a game in sevens and fifteens so like we we literally just went through like legally like all the reasons why you don't want to be doing this players went on strike they came back eventually once in the agree and you know if you like i just don't see like why would you take set of sevens players after that um you know it's uh like i think one i think the sevens players were right um it's you know if you if you want to be like if you look at the countries that are really good at sevens and that are really good at 15s um like they they keep those they they keep, they keep those teams separate uh you know like the, the blacks don't have guys jumping in from their sevens teams the, yeah you know even t team usa even keeps their sevens and 15s relatively separate you well know, the u.s actually, is not the, you know, the, the u.s Baker actually not invited, up. the u.s invited three guys to their roster who are the three guys that they invited uh pinkelman I'll have, to, I'll have to look at it, look it up, but uh, there's three guys uh, that they called up. But keep keep going, and I'll I'll find it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I just think like if you like, yeah. So I think if you, I like, ultimately I just think that um, you know if you want to keep them separate because I think like it's just it's just better the as you know one of the arguments that the sevens players were putting out um, you know when the strike was happening was that the training is different. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to, you know, um, the, the, even like your cardio and your conditioning for playing, you know, for, you know, playing those short, you know, seven minute halves um, at like full is different than your conditioning to go across the, you know, an 80 minute, uh, an 80 minute game of rugby. Um, you know, when you have to play a series of seven minute halves, when you're playing like two to three games a day as well, your conditioning is just different. Right. Um, your training is different. Um, you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more running, uh, in, in sevens as well, more open spaces. You got to be working on, you know, passes that cover a larger, uh, width of the field. Um, there's a lot of strategical differences as well. And it's like, I think like, I, like, there's a reason that I think, uh, the Canadian players, uh, the Canadian seven players want them to be separate, um, because, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think I think we're getting to the point where like you have the good sevens teams and the good uh, fifteen aside teams, and it's like you're gonna have to start kind of treating it like, you know, like different, different disciplines sport. and like athletics, yeah. right? Like you don't, you don't, you don't have the marathon guys train with sprinters, right. right? Like it's it's a different it's a different game. Like I know they're they're both running, but it's like there's different styles, right? Yeah. Um. So I think I'd like to see Canada stick with that. Uh, did that did that give you enough time to find the uh, yep. three USA guys? There? Um, yeah. Captain Madison Hughes, Martin okay, Isofo, yeah. and then Ben Pinkelman. Okay. And what do we think is the realistic chance that they actually make oh, the World Cup team? Probably not. I mean, the U. If you talk about like 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 the Canadian roster being set, I mean, I think the U.S. roster is a little bit even more set than than what we're dealing with. Um, I, I, I agree yeah. with you um, for most points. I think that the only thing is that the difference would be that there are some guys that do from the sevens program that do want to play at the World Cup for, for the 15s. Uh, Connor Braid is mm -hmm. one guy that I want to be called up to the, to the roster because he said continuously, especially at the beginning of this year, that he wanted to play in the 15s World Cup. So yeah. I agree with you. For the season of when the 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 rugby H, uh, seven series is being run, you leave them there. You do not touch them. Yeah. But I feel like because this is a World Cup and it starts around the same start time as their as their World Cup or their series, I think that I want to make an exception for 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 Connor Braid because one, I think he has an immense amount of talent that can transition into fifteens. I think that he he has had well one I know he's had experience uh, with the 15s team playing and also I know that um, it's something that he's been working towards. So I would like to see him come and join the team. And when we kind of talk about our lineups, I'll kind of go into that a little bit more. But um, uh -huh. what about the U20 team? Do you see anyone from that team 
making the jump? Yeah, I would I would like to see a couple of the U20 guys, to be honest with you. Um, I think I think one, I, I think we could go with uh, Will Priscillier at scrum half, I think would be a nice one to see. Uh, I mean, he's he's already he's playing pro in Europe already in France. Yeah, and he's oh, he's already capped. Um, so I think I think uh, I think that's a big one. I think he could definitely step in. Um, and you know, it goes back to what I was saying before. It's like I think like you know nobody's no one's spot is really solidified here. So um, I think that would be a good one too. I would also I don't know if I would say I want him on the team. Um, either one, but I would really, um, based on, on like their performances, um, throughout the year and especially with at the, the U20 tournament and, as well, um, I would really like to see, uh, Oideman and Nawadi, um, at least, I don't think they should necessarily make the team, but I think like, if you're kind of looking at like the future of Rugby Canada, um, you know, if Rugby, like, you know, if we're going to, as a country, if we're going to start climbing back up the world rankings here, um, you're, we're kind of got to start looking at some of these these younger players. Um, and like I said, like Priscilla has already been capped. Um, so he's been part of that environment. And he, to be honest, probably has a pretty decent shot of, you know, of making the team in some capacity as well. Um, but I think as well, but I think like, for Nawadi and Oideman too, like I think even if they're not on the team, I would almost just bring them to the World Cup, um, just to like have them in the environment. Um, I'm not like just have them in the environment, get them used to being around. Like, you know, let like DTH talk to Oideman and teach them about playing wing at the highest level and stuff. Yes. Uh, you know, just I think I think it's it would be great to just like expose these guys to you know, to like that World Cup camp, to the environment surrounding, you know, the training leading up to the World Cup. Even if you, do, even if ultimately you don't decide to take them on the team or um, I think just, just to have them around that environment, I think would be worth bringing them up after the U20s. Exactly. Training with the, with, with the, yeah. the senior men's program, you know, yeah. getting the exposure yeah. of picking their brains. Because, I mean, you're not going to have Tyler Arndron. You're not going to have DTH Van der Merver. Yeah. You're not going to have Taylor Paris around to kind of chat with all the time. So I agree with you completely. I, I don't see yeah. them competing for – and unfortunately, you know, the, the standouts from the U20 team, they're, they're positions of depth that we have on the senior yeah. team. That yeah. Yeah. Their they're, they're spots are really going to – I mean, uh, with, uh, Percy A, he's got the best chance out of the three of them, and he's, I still don't think he's going to make the roster over. Um, the three scrum halves that they have already, but I agree with you. I think that he and and the other and Oideman and Nagwadi they need they need to be there at least to just practice for uh, I would say at least the Pacific Nations Cup. After that, you yeah. you you would say thank you for your service and well, well, get them playing well, rugby again. I mean, I mean, even even at that, like with the way this the season's played out, it's like, um, like you said, it's like I like I think you know, they might be hard pressed to make this team and stuff. But if you look at like Oideman specifically, like with the Toronto arrows, Oideman has been beating out Lloyd for starting spots all year. Yeah. Um, like Oideman has way more starts than Kanoa Lloyd uh, on wing for the arrows. So um, like clearly he, he was doing something right that at least, you know, he might be able to, uh, he might, you know, to be honest, it's like, I don't know if he'll bank it with uh, D, you know, DTH Paris more Hassler. Um, but he might be able to make it interesting or at least, you know, make some guys ahead of him work harder and stuff too, because, you know, like more and more and Lloyd have already been, you know, in that position of battle with him all year where he's actually yeah. been able to, you know, earn starting spots over those two guys too. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that, that would be, you know, it's, it's, they may, they might not be on the team, but I think I would yeah. bring it. I would bring them just because they could make they could make it interesting. To be honest with you, yeah, kind of. Lloyd was an interesting, you know, player for the Arrows because you know he he never was really given that that starting spot except for I believe I don't know if he he started against one of the Texas teams in Canada. I don't know if it was Houston or Austin. I can't remember. But uh, uh, basically, I believe you know, Austin. He started against Austin during the uh, the three games in eight days stretch. Yeah, 
so you know he he had to compete you know he was at with canada came back and then immediately had to start competing against levas who just you know really took took that that wing position from anybody else and then oyman was off with the u20 so you know he he's an interesting yep. player that i would like to see what he does because but, you know but even had, before that you know the the arrows were rolling more in oyman on the wing for a while there too so yeah i mean he he was he he joined the team in utah and then uh yeah oideman really until he got hurt and then eventually was shipped off to the u20s um mm -hmm. really had that spot locked down so yeah, yeah i'll be interested to see what uh if maybe they pick oideman over lloyd because you know lloyd is 25 so he still has time but i i think that you're right i think oideman had a much better season so maybe Maybe they do go with him over him, or so it'll be very interesting. Um, yeah. So the, sure. the last thing uh, before we go on and answer more questions from uh, some fans off of Twitter is uh, I want to quickly go through a very very mock starting lineup. Now I had people uh, online and Reddit ask us to do one for the World Cup, and I told them that's not going to happen because <laughs> there's so much rugby to happen between now in the world cup that if i put a roster out there of for the world cup for canada i'm probably gonna look like an idiot because it's oh, probably gonna change then but oh, i think oh, then we're, we're guaranteed to look to look bad yeah but i think an interesting thing to do would be at least look at a, a starting lineup and a bench for the pacific nations cup because i want to see what you have uh and i i think that you'll be not surprised by some of the guys i picked all right, so uh, how do you want to do this? Just go like group by group here. Start with the front row. Sure. All right, so like I said, um, I'm going with every spot here is truly up for grabs, but um, but I would go with my front row right now is I'm gonna go with Rob Brower, uh, Benoit Pifero, and Matt Tierney up front to start okay i i got the same number one i got brower but then i put eric howard at two and then jake ilnicki at tight head yeah i think i think uh yeah i i think brower's brower's play um uh like he's that's his spot to lose now i think based on what, yeah. what he's done in major league rugby it's uh you know it's the other guys that got to play their way uh deep uh Justice Sears Duru, uh, Noel Barker, Hubert Bidens. It's like that's 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 kind of that's on them now, I think, yeah. to, to you know earn their way back into that one jersey. Um if if they want it. Um but yeah, I think uh Hooker, uh Pifero, Quatra, and Howard um is how I rank them. Uh personally. I think either one of those three guys can be like, oh, yeah. like you said, that's why you don't want to do the World Cup one. I think either one of those three guys could be starting at the yeah. World Cup. I think what I like um, to be honest. As I say, I think what I liked Sorry. about Howard is that I liked the offensive side of the ball as well. Um, he was a really strong ball carrier mm -hmm. this year for for Nola, and they 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 used him quite frequently. And for for the majority of the season, he was leading yeah. the league in try assists. So I liked mm -hmm. that side of the, the 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 play that he carried for for Nola, and he was also the vice captain for them, and and for for the most part, captain for them for the majority yeah. of the season, which I liked as well. Yeah, I just, I, uh, I, yeah, like I said, to be honest with you, I think through the course of the Pacific Nations Cup, all three of them should get a start. Oh, I agree with you. Just, you know, yeah. let's, let's see, what, let's see what we got. Let's see who's playing better. Um, you should, all three of them should get a start. All they, then all three of them should like come off the bench. And to be honest with you, it's probably the same thing at tight head prop. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you should probably get uh, Tierney, Illiniki, and uh, Keith. All, all should probably get a start there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, because I, I I think I think Keith has a real real good shot of of starting in that that number three jersey as well because you know I wasn't very impressed yeah. with him um, at the ARC but I mean there weren't a whole lot of Canadians that I could be impressed with at the ARC um, but as the season went along Keith's game really improved I remember we had one episode where I was very not upset but I was very confused on how poorly he was playing. Mm -hmm. um but like i will admit he got much better as the season went on you know so 
So kudos to him for really coming into form. All right, second row. Who do you have? Oh man, second row. Second row is a tough one. Uh, there's a, I think that there's a little bit of depth here at the second row that kind of makes it should make it an interesting positional battle as well. But I think to come out for the first game, I think I'm going to go with Mike Shepard and Evan Olmstead. Yeah, I got the same thing. Yeah, um, Connor Keys, Paul Cellini, um, Larson, and Bailey would be um, the uh, the. The other guys there um but uh bailey's an interesting one too because he could play back row so that's going to be another guy that's like where does you know he actually slot where, in where do they see him stuff. fitting in yeah yeah um so uh yeah so you know it, it kind of depends on like i said too earlier it's like you could put our drawn in the second row if you wanted to too so yeah um so again, I think I think again, I think it comes down to it's like all all of these guys should be getting playing time during the Pacific Nations Cup. Yeah. Um just at in, in some capacity, even if just you know, to get to get everybody everybody's gotta be in um just to try it right now. So yeah. I think I think that's especially true for the forward pack. Um I think that yeah. you're right. a lot of people do need to come in and see what they, they can offer. I'd like to keep the backs as close to form as possible i think you, you do mm -hmm. the you do the experimenting on the bench you know coming off um because i'd like to see that that back line be a little bit more in form in terms of chemistry um yeah. but let's go let's go with the back row because I, I have the same thing as you and i agree with you who do you who did you have for the back row uh my back row would be rumble penny and ardron okay see i had i had bailey at the six jersey ardron and then rumble you you put uh, Rumble at eight or sorry you put Rumble at eight or uh, I put Rumble at seven. Oh okay okay yeah yeah uh yeah like I said uh, um yeah I think Nakai Penny I think has just had an unreal year um and uh, I think I think with right now especially like he had an amazing game in the uh, the final the too. final um yeah so uh, I, like I said man like it's all, all like yeah like I think Rumble and Ardron to be honest with you. Um, especially since they're named captains, um, they're probably okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, Ar Ardron's absolutely okay because he's oh, Tyler yeah. Ardron. Um, but you know, almost uh, probably safe too. Um, which is it makes it difficult if you're a back row player because you have those two guys to contend with. Yeah. Um, slot in, but that that uh, you know, that other flanker spot. Or whatever, there's a lot of guys that could play for that. Even you know Matt Heaton uh, could also be up there too. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Heaton, Penny, Bailey. It should be uh, should be interesting to see who ultimately you know, you know, come the World Cup, who's ultimately wearing um the yeah. back row jerseys here. Well, I mean that's what that's why I put I put Bailey there for now. And I, I kind of put an asterisk for now because Ty goes to the veteran, right? Yeah. I, you know, I think that Nakai Penny has a very strong chance of stealing that that six jersey from bailey so you know kyle bailey will need to play his rear end off um okay so coming to the backs now we'll start with nine and ten first who did you have for your nine and ten i think right now well as you said as you said right now hey uh ty goes to the veteran um so my nine i'm gonna go with phil mack and ten i have shane o'leary i i have the exact same thing yeah uh, Shane O'Leary uh, was the the leading scorer in the uh, RFU Championship this year, um, so uh, definitely going to you know utilize that, utilize his goal kicking as well. Um, so I mean that that's that's a you know that's a that's a tough spot to kind of knock him down from. I think right now, um, the other really the other fly halves options are uh, Parfrey and uh, McCrory. So um, yeah, you know I. I uh, I watched because this is this is one that was one position that I I was the, the fly off position where I was like well do we go with McRory he you know he played at the Repechage and you know mm -hmm. he, he played fairly well and he had really strong goal kicking but I think the one thing that I really liked about O'Leary and I, I was watching some highlights of his is his kicking ability as well um, yeah you know uh, he he really used his boot to uh, gain advantage of position on the field for uh, for his team uh, Nottingham. I believe that's yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it. Yeah. 
So, Nottingham, you know, Nottingham I, rugby, yeah. yeah, Nottingham rugby. So I'll be really interested to see the chemistry between Mac and O'Leary. So O'Leary really hasn't gotten a whole lot of team Canada time in the last few years under Kings no. and Jones. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that, uh, that chemistry develop and see how quickly the, the cord gets pulled in case, you know, you know, Jones doesn't like it. Yeah. And, uh, to be honest too, like, I think, um, like I, I'm not really, really, really sure how this, how, you know, like you said, you don't want to make the prediction of the world cup roster yet because you know, it's so early and there's a lot of rugby to be played between now and then. Um, but you know, if you have uh, Gordon McCrory might be one of those guys that's just, uh, you know, just really unlucky by the time the World Cup roster comes around. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, uh, to like looking at it and it's like, I think that that might be him. Uh, just I, like the unlucky final cut guy. So uh, I think Gordon McCrory is just happened. I, and again, you don't know personal life. You don't know jobs. You know, you don't know that what what yeah. kind of pulled you back on certain things but i think probably his worst rugby decision was not playing some form of pro rugby this year you know getting getting your face yeah, work, and, what you could do you know i'm sure i'm sure there was an mlr team that would have would have taken him i mean he, he just started he was a starting fly half for canada yeah. at the repishage and then during some of the games when yeah he the AFC. exactly yeah. so you know i i don't see why yeah he, it, it, Yeah, that that's exactly it though. Like even uh, you know, even even Parfrey, um, you know, he, you know, he he's been saying that he wants to play for you know on the World Cup squad, and you know he you know he found a spot on a team, you know, even though it was part way through the year already. Um, you know, uh, Jeff Hassler too did the exact same thing, right? They they were able to find, you know, they were able to find spots on teams part way through the season, um, in order to uh, to get some of that experience, get help them get back into playing shape, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, like it's stuff, you, it's like you, you know, not you don't necessarily know anything about his personal life or anything or, you know, what factored into that decision. But, um, you know, I think, I think going forward, I think with major league rugby too, you do kind of want to set that, that standard. It's like, you, like you want guys to be, uh, you want to be encouraging guys to be playing pro all year. Right. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, being in that, environment all the time like that's that's really the like, that's the whole point of major league rugby um you know to give to it gives players um even players that didn't uh make the 44 man roster here but it gives those players you know chances to play professionally and to you know to make themselves better and then you know hopefully you know in four years time they can also you know they they improve over a larger period of time and then you know maybe in four years it's like they're they're in consideration for uh you know, Team Canada as well, or the, you know any of the other tournaments that are going to happen between now and the next World Cup. Um, so I think I think ultimately, the, yeah, like it comes down to, uh, you know, so, sometimes you know you've got to. I think as a country, Canada has to transition that from being, you know, if they want to compete and they want to get back to, you know, creeping in on the top end like they once were about ten years ago. Um, like you kind of got to start shifting to being that fully professional environment and everything. So, um, you know, uh, not that I, not that I think that, not that I wouldn't take McCrory just solely because he didn't play pro yeah. this year. Yeah. But I think, uh, but I think seeing how some guy, I think seeing though how other players have improved over the course of a major league rugby season, um, like it, it might ultimately, you know, it might, it might end up. It comes down to that. Yeah. 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 And I think that's the big thing is we're not saying that his spot is lost, uh, but just in terms yeah, of, no, 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 in terms of fitness lost. and form, you know, it might have a big right. difference. Um, yeah, okay. it, could, it could. I know, I know at the, uh, remember when I first, uh, just before the Utah game went to uh, talk to a handful of the Arrows players and then, you know, Lucas Rumble was talking about like the gap between the elite level games and stuff. And it's, like major league rugby would be a great thing to like fill that gap and you know but if you're not if you're not playing major league rugby you still have that gap right so mm -hmm. um yeah. so uh you know like you said like his spot's definitely not lost every every spot in my opinion is still up for grabs um i've said that i don't even know probably countless times already <laughs> and the listeners are probably sick of me hearing me say that exact same <laughs> sentence um but uh but ultimately it's it's true and you know so 
um, it's gonna it's gonna be a hard hard squad to make. But yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about the centers then. Who do you have at the twelve and the thirteen? So I got uh, Kieran Hearn and Connor Trainer at twelve and thirteen, respectively. Okay. I have Connor Braid at the twelve and DTH Ooh. at thirteen. Ooh. Okay. Interesting. I like I like Braid at twelve because why why DTH at thirteen? Uh, well, there's been a couple articles written about how about when DTH started playing for Canada, he played at 13 and that was his best position for Canada. Um, I think with Hasler yeah. coming back into the fold, I think that has kind of forced the position of putting DTH at 13. I think that's honestly the best decision. It spreads out the depth. And a lot of this has to do with like my 14 the guy who I chose for my 14 position, if he continues to play well, like so, he did. So, so who, who is that? I chose Taylor Paris at 14. And who's your 11? Uh, Hassler. Hassler, yeah. Okay. So the, 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 this, this is all, again, a little asterisk about how well Taylor play, uh, Paris plays. If he continues to play well, like he did at the, the last game of the repechage, and then how he played uh, in, uh, I think, in, in France, uh, I think that it pushes the decision to move DTH to 13 because I think that just is spreading the wealth in terms of uh, not only DTH's best uh, two assets is he's a strong ball carrier in terms of running and power running, but he is also a playmaker. I think that's the same reason why I wanted Connor Braid on my uh, my 12 jersey. You know, I could have picked uh, Lesage or I could have picked um, George Barton at 13 mm -hmm. and, you know, put – um uh, dth at 12 but i think one of the biggest problems i've been seeing with canada especially and their back line is just, just no creativity i think that it's a lot of and you know anyone wants to look more yeah. look at which rugby about what's going wrong with canada and it talks really a lot about you know the, the, the there's no creativity in, in the back line and it's you know maybe a switch, but it's basically just constantly running the ball into a constant wave of defense. So I think by putting two playmakers at your 12 and a 13, who are both very capable ball carriers. I think yeah. that opens up some fluidity to open up the wings and open up your forwards and open up the, the, the fullback to kind of be willing to, to move into the, uh, the defense. And when you got guys like, you know, Theo Sauter and then Kieran Hearn are able to play the fullback position. I want them to be engaged in the offense. So I think with those two as my centers, uh, Braid and uh, DTH, I think that that opens up a lot of play. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, that's that's definitely definitely a fair thing to say. I think, yeah, that that Squidge video is uh, is is pretty great, highlighting the uh, the the simplicity of the Canadian attack sometimes. Um, which, which is interesting because, like, the arrows do not attack like that at all. So it might be interesting to, you know, mix some of that style of play in. Um, but uh, I put DTH uh, on the wing with uh, Taylor Paris. Um, basically, I, don't, I think, like, I mean, I know, like, DTH can play center, but I think, uh, but I think ultimately, I think his best position is wing. He's got that, uh, he's got the speed, he's, He's got the strength, like killer finishing touch as well, um, and ultimately, I think it's his best position. And I think with the way uh, you know he he's like third all time in uh, the uh, excuse me, he's the third all time in the uh, you know the Guinness uh, uh, Pro Fourteen or um, so yeah, he's third all time in uh, you know Guinness Pro Fourteen rugby right now. Right um, in you know scoring and stuff and i think he's um I, I think it's just i think when you have a player like that like you have ardron you have dth i think when you have when you're a team like canada and you have two guys that are like you know your best players i think you want your best players playing at their best at position their best positions um even if that necessarily you know even if that necessarily means there's like a little bit of a step down to you know, the next guy in waiting at one side or in the case of DTH playing wing, it might mean that it creates a little bit of depth, a little bit of extra depth to the point where, 
you know, get to the point where maybe, you know, one of more Hassler or Lloyd ends up having to get cut from the team at the end. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think for me personally, I'm like the DTH is the best back on the team and I want the best back on the team playing in his best position, right. um, which in my opinion is wing. So that's where thing, I would have him. Personally. The other thing too is Hassler also covers the center as well. And with, exactly. my, ro- more. with my roster, yeah, more as well. I think with my roster, I'm definitely taking a chance with DTH being at 13. But I think mm. watching enough, you know, I think having someone like Ben Lesage um, uh, as, as, you know, a crushing center or George Barton is useful. I just think, you know, after watching the arrow centers, um, yeah. you know, Detroit and um, Jones yeah. do what they did, I can't help but think that that form of play too – to fast but still strong centers uh, could be really useful for Canada. And again, you're, I, I agree with you to a certain extent. I think that you're right that it's for some players, you do need to have them in their best position because who knows? My roster, if you put it out in the first game, maybe it goes horribly. You know, <laughs> I think, think you definitely picked a much safer, uh, more proven position. I just think that this would be an interesting lineup to see go against. Um, and really, anybody. I just I, I want to see it. I want to see uh, DTH at center. Um, but who did you have at uh, fullback? Well, I uh, yeah, I for my fullback, I took the I think the guy that just uh, made the most sense to put at fullback, which is Peter Nelson. Um, you know, the- Theo Souter is not here because uh, he's still injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so I think you know Peter uh, Peter Nelson, who a uh, bit of a you. Utility back, Falster, uh, has not uh, never played for Canada before. Is qualifying under, I believe he has a Canadian grandmother. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's been, you know, has had over 60 games with Ulster. Um, and, uh, you know, he's split his time, I believe, between fly half and fullback. So, yeah. Um, based on that, I think you know, he's, he's really, you know, without Theo Souter here, I think he's the, the choice for the fullback. Um, Pat Parfrey can also play fullback, but uh, right now, I, I as my roster right now, I have him kind of back or the guy one step behind O'Leary. So, uh, but he could also shift the fullback too. But I think yeah. uh, I think just uh, sort of the um, I guess if there's any position where Canada does not have depth right now, it's fullback. And I yeah. think it's uh, yeah. I think it's I think Peter Nelson is just kind of the choice here. Which makes what you know them yes. not picking Brock Staller even more confusing because he can cover the fullback. Yes, yeah, it does. Yeah, um, I picked. Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I picked Kieran Hearn. Um, I liked what I saw from Kieran him. Is the- I, I liked what I saw from him at the ARC, um, especially with his boot. Um, again, I don't know. I haven't seen mm-hmm. anything from Peter Nelson to be confident in putting him in that position. So I'm just going with what I know, and that's. Hearn, uh, fair. It could very well be the the right decision to put Nelson in um, at fifteen, but I'm just going with what I know. I'm a simple guy. I just know that know what Hearn looks like at the fifteen. So that's what I'm going to go with. So quickly, who do you? Fair. We're just going to go through our bench quickly because I don't think we need to talk about every single guy like we just did. But uh, for my bench, um, sixteen I have Quatrin, seventeen I have Bidens, eighteen I have Tierney. 19, I have Connor Keys. 20, I have Penny. 21, I have McRory. 22, I have Dan Moore. And 23, I have Lesage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's pretty pretty close here. Uh, I, yeah, I would go with... Uh, so, yeah, my, my 16 would be Quatrin, too. Who'd you say your 17 was again? Biden's. But I had I had uh, Sears Duru at seventeen. And I had Ilaniki at eighteen. Um, I had I did Connor Keys. Uh, nineteen, um, and I had Matt Heaton at twenty. Or sorry, not Matt Heaton. Kyle Bailey. I wrote this out of order. Excuse me. That's okay. Kyle Bailey at twenty. Um, uh. 21, I went with Andrew Ferguson. 
22, I had Dan Moore, and 23, I went with Ben Lesage as well. Yeah, the only the only one that really I like I struggled with for my bench was Ferguson or McRory. And I think it came down to McRory can cover either the 10 or the 9. So yeah. that, that was my biggest my biggest uh, struggle there. Um, so we're quickly going to go through some questions um, that people had about uh, some other Canaan or rugby questions. Um, so this one is actually from someone who is uh, that I've met personally. Uh, he actually coached me for a few games when I tried out for my university's rugby team, uh, Paul Hunter. And if people don't know who Paul Hunter is, he actually works for Rugby Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and his question was, how far can rugby grow in Canada? Where, where do you see Canada rugby become, uh, growing to in Canada? And I think, I think this question is very interesting because I think it has a different meaning for both men and women. Um, you know, in some provinces, for women, rugby is the only contact sport that you're allowed to play. Mm -hmm. I think that, and you see it in, in the success of our, our senior teams, both for the sevens and for the fifteens, is that it has become a very popular sport for young women in Canada. And I think that's something that Rugby Canada needs to develop, is that this program for women can be such a life-changing experience. And I think that as it grows down in the States for NCAA and as it grows um, here at home with uh, youth sports, I think that we need to start creating pathways for, for women in, in rugby because I think that it gives them an opportunity to kind of grow. Um, and we had another fan on Twitter talk about the impact that rugby was having out east. I believe it was in New Brunswick, but I have to double check um, with some uh, immigrant families uh, wanting to play rugby. Um, they tried playing soccer, but they really enjoyed rugby because of its camaraderie and, and family atmosphere. And really, at the end of the day, I think that's what rugby can grow into, is I think it can be yeah. a place for people to come and, and join a family and, and, and really become part of a community. Um, when, uh, whenever you go anywhere, as long as you can find a rugby club, you have minimum 15 friends there. You know, I think that that's the big thing is that rugby needs to start developing in Canada as, as not even just uh, a, a sport for, you know, premier athletes, but I think it needs to become more of a recreational sport as well. I think that's one of the biggest downsides is if you're not going to grow any fans if they don't have a chance to play it as well. I think mm -hmm. that's something that, that can be worked on that requires, you know, time and also athletes to play the sport. But I think that rugby in Canada can really grow to be a really fun alternative for people that are looking for something different than, than hockey or lacrosse or football. I think that it needs to be um, treated as such because I think that some people in the rugby world kind of have this mentality that rugby can grow to be a dynamo sport in Canada, which I think it can, but at the same time, we need to kind of treat it as a slow grow. I don't know, Derek, what do you think about this question? Oh, yeah, I think, well, I think there's uh, there's a number of ways you can really kind of approach it as far as grow. I mean, there's there's different ways. Uh, there's different ways to grow a sport, right? Like if you, you can, like you said, you were kind of touching on like the community surrounding you know, like your local clubs and stuff. And, you know, uh, but, you know, there's there's different ways you can go about, you know, growing participation numbers um, as well as just growing, like, people that can become fans of the sport in general. Um, I think I think Major League Rugby, um, one is a, is a massive step, um, is a massive step to actually, uh, you know, make, making uh, the game more popular, not just in Canada, but North America as a whole. Um, you know, I think, I think, I think to be honest with you, I think even like the Toronto Wolfpack are, are an, an example of that, but just, you know, it's like, you know, if you go back like five years, nobody, nobody plays rugby league or even watches rugby league in Canada. They put a professional rugby league team in Canada and now, you know, people are watching it now. Um, just, you know, because it became an accessible thing. Um, and I think major league rugby kind of does have that same thing. I know, uh, you know, uh, one of the, th in that, that squ uh, squidge rugby video that you referenced earlier, uh, one of the things that he talks about 
in that is uh, a declining participation numbers after, you know, people get out of high school and, you know, um, and I think, you know, Major League Rugby having the Toronto Arrows having Major League Rugby as a whole, it gives people like, you know, it gives like elite player, the elite young player, something to aspire to that, you know, they can actually, you know, you can grow up, you know, you, you, you know, there could be like a, you know, a seven year old kid right now. That's just, you know, Dan Moore is the greatest person on the planet to, um, you know, have like posters or like autographed jerseys or stuff hanging on his wall. Um, and like, that's kind of what you want to have, you know, the, the impact that you want like, the arrows to have. Mm-hmm. Um, because like, you know, if, by being there, you can become, you know, you can become like the the thing that you know players can like aspire to be. Um, so like I think that that's a growth uh, thing as well. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing to help rugby grow is you gotta make it accessible, um, which is something that we talked about a little bit earlier today. Um, with just being, you know, have have the games available for free, whether it's Facebook, whether it's just a you know, a TV channel that everybody already has anyways. Um, so, so people don't have to necessarily put extra money down to um, into the game and, uh, you know, just make it accessible. It's, you know, nobody's going to find out about rugby if you, if you can't watch it, if it's difficult to watch. Um, so that even comes down to, you know, we got to get, we got to get more, you know, uh, the Canadian national team has, has to be on TV more. Um, they have to, uh, they have to be on TV more, whether it's, uh, you know, just live games or like hopefully doing interviews and stuff. We got to, uh, you know, it'd be great to, you know, even even with it, it'd be great to find find a way to get, you know, Major League Rugby highlights into like Sports Center or, yeah. um, you know, or, or something like that. Right. Just to, you know, that way it's, you know, people just watching their regular sports news in the morning or, you know, will end up, you know, seeing rugby, you know, say in between you know, in between the 40th segment talking about Mitch Marner's contract and whether or not Kawhi stays, you can put like a rugby oh. highlight or something. Um, so like that, you know, that would be like, that would be something that would be, I think would be great to see. Um, and I think, you know, just making, making the game, they said making the game accessible, um, you know, going back to uh, your, your point about the clubs, it's like, just, you know, make, have all, all those local clubs. It's like, just be, and I know it already is, but just be like a really welcoming, like in, wel- welcoming and like inclusive environment that people, you know, when, the, when they go to the club to maybe try it out for the first time, they want to come back constantly. Yeah. Right? Um, I think that's, that's part of it. Just make it a really accessible game. Uh, make it be able to make it easy to watch, make it easy for people to come out to play. Um, be be welcoming to new fans. Um, I think is a big one too. Yes. And to be honest with you, I know I see a lot um, of time on Twitter and stuff. Major League Rugby broadcasts have been in my taking some flack for you know putting up the this is how you score graphics or you know these are like the basic rule graphics. And honestly, I think like yeah, just suck it up, guys. Like we you need to be teaching people about the game and. Um, yes. And you know what, even though I'm a, personally, I'm a diehard rugby fan and I don't need, and I don't need to be told how many points a try is worth, you know, during the, every, at the beginning of every broadcast of a game I watch, there's somebody that's watching this game for the first time that has no idea how much a try is worth. And that was yeah. actually very valuable piece of information to, them. um, right. So it's like, I think, you know, you, it's uh, yeah. Be, be the commentators should be explaining the rules as the game goes on uh, to try to teach. Um, if you're watching with somebody that's never seen a game before, if you're trying to get your friends into it, take time out of your viewership as well to start explaining the rules or explaining the strategy. Um, you know, ex- even explaining things. You know, why a team try to drop kick there or you yeah. know, something to that effect. Uh, it's like you know that just educate people and like that's how the game's gonna grow. Uh, make it accessible, be welcoming to people, you know, um, in, welcome new fans into it, um, you know, and, you know, take take time out of your own day to, like, teach people about about rugby and things like that. Um, yeah, so that that's, that's – if I think if you do that, rugby can become an insanely popular sport in, yeah. uh, in North America. And, like, one thing, too, is uh, look at basketball sign-ups. You know that'll be coming in this fall. Look at basketball yeah. signups when Vince Carter was 
You know, the, the, the yep. current national basketball team for Canada is guys that grew up watching Vince Carter. You know, it was, they were, they were fun. Totally. The Raptors were fun and the Raptors won, you know? So the, the product that, that, that rugby Canada and the Toronto arrows, and eventually if, you know, Vancouver or Alberta gets, gets an MLR team, the, the more kids watch the rugby and see how fun of a product it is, the more they're going to want to play. And the more events that, exactly. that the arrows do for kids run training camps or, you know, rookie rugby camps. I think rookie rugby is a great program that rugby Canada runs where they go to schools. I think anytime you can run anything like that to get kids involved as well, get ball, you know, you know a lot of people say this, get balls into people's hands and they'll, they'll fall in love with the sport. I think that's really big. Um, another question. This is from the Earful of Dirt podcast. Mm -hmm. Why does Kingley, Kingsley Jones wear skinny jeans? Why not? Why not? You know, if you if you got it, flaunt it. Yeah, you know, it's, I I, I can't pull them off, but if if Kingsley Jones can pull them off, go for it, buddy. Yeah, by all means. You know, I I, I to be honest, I don't I don't really care what he wears. Just win the World Cup. Yeah, when is the World yeah, Cup? You, you can wear the skinny jeans. You want, win the World Cup. Yeah, you can dress like mm -hmm. Mick Jagger for all I care. Just win the World Cup. The, yeah, no, you, yeah, wear, wear anything you, Kingsley, honestly, if you're listening, man, wear anything that you want, uh, just win a world cup. Yeah. Uh, so a couple, a couple news and notes about rugby Canada in the last uh, few weeks. Um, the women's sevens qualified for the Olympics. So congratulations, uh, to them. That was a really exciting, uh, season to watch for them. You know, they had a kind of down season for the 20, uh, 27, 2018 season. So to see them bounce back, win one of the series, and be consistently top five in almost every tournament, it was a really, really fun season to watch. So I'm excited for next year and for the Olympics. Um, I mean, this, mm -hmm. the men's sevens had a you know up and down season, but they finished off really strong, especially with some of the younger guys yeah. kind of contributing. Um, so they are going down uh, to uh, compete for the America's sevens qualifier for the Olympics. So. Best of luck to them. They just announced the, the roster for it. It looks like a pretty strong roster. So, you know, hopefully that they, they will play hard next weekend and uh, they'll have a good outcome. And the last thing, um, and this is something that uh, I think this is a fantastic uh, opportunity for, for the Senior Women's 15 program. Uh, they'll be having a super series coming up very soon in San Diego. The, the top five women's teams in the world. New Zealand, Canada, uh, the U.S., France, and England will be competing in this Super Series. Derek, this is something that uh, they've done before, but why do you think this is important for Rugby Canada to, to participate in? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely it, – it helps grow the uh, the women's side of the game. You know, it's uh, it's great to see uh, – you know the you know in the countries that they're going to have to compete with, uh, like you know New Zealand's going, I think England's going, um, right? So it's like it's you know it's 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 they get to play against teams that you know we don't really get to see again in North America that often. Um, you know, like New Zealand's not here very often, England's not here very often. Um, so it's uh, you know at least on the men's side they're not here very yeah. often. Yeah. Um, so it give you know it, it gives the fan, like fan bases the exposure to those elite rugby nations um which is also great uh it's also nice to put the uh you know put the women's game on a big stage too um women women's rugby is uh, an amazing sport as well just uh it's it's awesome and i think like you know when, when, once once people see it it's like they'll uh you know hopefully hopefully jump on board and you know start supporting it and uh and everything so uh, hope, you know, hopefully this tournament can just be like a big, uh, you know, a big uh, stepping stone to them doing things like this a lot more frequently. I think the, the thing that bothers me the most about the women's program is they're so underplayed. You know, they, they don't get a whole lot yeah. of test matches and normally it's against the U.S. And sometimes mm -hmm. they'll do like, an, uh, like a European tour where they'll play a couple teams. So for them yeah. to have this opportunity uh, to be able to play and to be able to show that, you know, they are – the best of the best i think yeah. this is really important and again i believe and you know i don't know a whole lot about the uh women's 15s team but it looks like the the team that they're they're sending is is fairly young and uh very uh rugby quebec uh they've got a lot of people from quebec so that's really interesting to see you don't see that whole lot on the men's side so you know 
rugby Quebec is doing something right for at least for the women. So it'll be yeah. very, very interesting to see how the, how they do. Uh, and uh, I look forward to watching it. Yeah, absolutely. It should be good. Um, uh, best of luck to them. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they walk away with the uh, series championship there too. Yeah. Well guys, thank you very much for, uh, for listening to us today. Um, if you have any questions or if you have anything to say to us, uh, follow us at Le Rouge Rugby. Uh, we will be most likely taking a little bit of a break uh, until closer to Pacific Nations Cup. We'll try to get some uh, some people on that uh, you guys liked hearing. So if there's anybody that you want to hear, join us on the podcast. Or if you have any talking points that you think that would be fun for us to listen to, feel free to uh, tweet at us. Um, we're also pretty active on Reddit. So if you see anything on Reddit that you want us to talk about, let us know. Uh, thanks again, Derek, for joining me today. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Take care.